Ladies and gentlemen, welcome in this new Fleet Europe webinar, and this with the support of TomTom Telematics. My name is Steven Schoofs, I'm the Chief Editor of Fleet Europe, and I have the pleasure to be the moderator of today's webcast. The webinar today is for information purposes only and is not a sales tool. But let's look forward. What are we going to talk about? Well, today we will deep dive into the GDPR and data privacy topic. GDPR stands for General Data Protection Regulation. And it came into force in the European Union on the 25th of May 2018. So not so long ago. And this new legislation forces companies to be extremely careful when handling personal data. No wonder that GDPR will have serious consequences for the collection and the storage of fleet management data and telematics information. And so you can imagine that it will also have a direct impact on how vehicle fleet operators gather and process data. Now, what will be the exact impact of GDPR and the data privacy discussion on vehicle fleet management in a connected business environment? Well, the answer will be given in this Engaging Fleet Europe webinar with the support of TomTom Tom Telematics. We are lucky today that during this webinar, three distinguished experts will guide you through this hot pressing topic. You can see them already on the screen. So we have Jan Jan Lowes from Deloitte, Simon Hania from TomTom, Tom, and Georges de Boer of TomTom Tom Telematics. If you have any question for our experts during the webcast, you can send it by using the chat function of your webinar tool. And at the end of the webinar, we will then have a little Q&A with our experts where your questions will be answered. So let's start. Our first speaker is Jan Jan Lowes. He is senior manager at Deloitte and he will introduce the topic and talk about why you should care around privacy. Now I hope that everything is fine and that Jan Jan can hear me clearly. Jan Jan? Yes, hello Steven. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you very much, Stephen, and thank you for having me. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, on the webinar. Um, after working over, for over a decade in privacy, I know that compliance with privacy laws such as the GDPR is an important topic. But I've also seen during that time that there is more to compliance, uh, more to privacy than just the compliance bit. Um, there's an overriding issue that people expect us how to handle data and that we know what they are concerned about. Today for you, I would like as an introduction to address that overriding issue, but also after that go into why should we really care about this overriding issue? And um, are there any solutions how we can maybe take this up going forward into the future on how to deal with it? First off, that overriding issue itself. Apart from the GDPR, what do we see is what people care about. People are really afraid of what we call function creep. Function creep is the basic knowledge that once you have something that you use for a particular purpose, that it can also be reused for a different purpose. This is not something new. We have seen it all throughout history and we give some examples later on, but people are actually afraid that this will happen to their data. And it's one of their main concerns daily and whether or not the GDPR says you can or cannot use the data, it has to be addressed as well. Before why we should address it and how we can, first a couple of examples of, of function creep. We all know this example of function creep. In the past, a driver's license, as you see here depicted on the left, uh, was just used for one thing. It would show that you were allowed to drive a car. However, through function creep, over time, this has also become, the driver's license has also gotten another purpose. For instance, in the Netherlands at least, for now a driver's license show that I'm legally allowed to buy cigarettes and alcohol, something I can only purchase after the, the age of 18, 
just as I can only have a driver's license after the age of 18. This is an example of function creep, where one thing, a driver's license, which said you can drive a car, is now saying something completely different. You are about to, you are allowed to buy cigarettes and alcohol. Function creep can also happen on data, as we can see in the next example. Um, for instance, take this. There is a website that's called 23andMe. You can send out your saliva to this website and they will analyze your G DNA for you. You get a copy of your own DNA and if you want to, they store it in their database for other purposes as well. One of those other purposes was that a website creator created a website where you had to log in with your 23andMe and me ID. Um, it would then check your DNA and it would only allow you onto the website if you were of sufficient European ancestry. This could be checked by seeing your DNA and from what you thought was an interesting thing to do, having your own DNA analyzed for your own uh, interest, uh, has now become, through function creep, apparently something you need to log on to this website. So that's an example of how data, this, in this case DNA data, can be misused um, as part of function creep. On the next example, we see another idea of this. And it's coming closer and closer to what we can do with connected cars. This is a function, an example of function creep on data of connected devices. In this case, connected toothbrushes. These are connected to the internet and they give us all kinds of information on how we brush our teeth, do we do it long enough, etc., etc. However, a former boss of the NSA agency in America has already said, well, if we can, we'll use that data to actually spy on you. So here you have it, through a functioning creep of connected devices and the data that's coming from, people are now hazardous to actually, hey, if I leave my data over here, where does this go? But function creep can also have a positive side where we can see that connected cards are actually used in people's benefits. Take for instance this example, a Norwegian Tesla owner was fined for parking in a zone where he could only be parked for 10 minutes. He actually claimed he was there for less than 10 minutes and he said, well, if there's one company that knows, it's actually Tesla. And by getting that data from Tesla, he would be able to get out of the fine from the Norwegian government. So this is also an example of function creep, specifically on data of connected cars, but now used for the benefit uh, of the individual user. However, by and large, people, what people are afraid of, apart from anything else apart from the GDPR is actually this kind of function creep. Will data be used against me or will I have a say as well in how data is used, collected on me, to so that it can be used for my own benefit? Now, these were the examples on function creep. If I then go to the next subject of why should we care about this? Why is there more to privacy than just compliance? Um, it's actually to do with one overriding theme. Um, it has to do with trust. For proper function of our digital solutions, whatever we think of, we actually need the public's buy-in. And we can only get the public's buy-in if they actually trust us with their data. Now, in principle, people tend to trust new technology. They engage with it, they see the benefits, and the majority of people will happily use it ever after. However, privacy incident, which includes security incidents, can rapidly erode that inherent trust that you get from people seeing and using new technologies. Um, and we all know that all kinds of new technologies, also those in connected cars, can have huge impact, not only for us as organizations that would like to use that data to, for instance, manage our fleets, but also in, uh, for a better environment, for cleaner air, uh, and so on and so forth. So it has a real societal impact. Now, imagine the nightmare scenario that multiple incidents in the area of privacy and security, maybe not strictly against the GDPR, but get picked up by media coverage, which results in a populist campaign against our solutions, uh, maybe causing a majority of users to lose trust and actually revoke our services. That would not have only a detrimental effect for ourselves, but also for those other societal goals we are trying to reach. So what should we then do about uh, having people's trust and creating people's trust? Well, that differs on a case-per-case -case basis, but if there's one thing we can say throughout, 
um, we very strongly believe that the most efficient way to take privacy in account is from right in the beginning, rather than an add-on or an afterthought uh, after you have actually created the product or service that you are putting in the market. To give you an example of how this uh, um, um, uh, uh, can be done, um, we can see that there is two sides to which you can use actually the GDPR. On the one side, you can see that there's regulatory pressure. It's the policies, it's the contracts, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all the things that you actually need to do. On the other side, you can also see this as a growth opportunity. Um, this may give you a competitive advantage by knowing what privacy is, sticking to the rules, and maybe protecting your customers and engaging with them so that they actually have your trust. If we then go to the next slide, we actually see how this may be done. And this is just an example of how we say, well, please apply privacy by design. Consider privacy uh, and embedding it in your processes as early on. Here you see just a mock-up example of um, uh, an actually design process, but it's very important that you already consider in the ID and in the concept phases, the first ones in your product, the possible pri privacy potentials of what you are creating. And this has to be maintained all the way down to the retirement phase when you are actually throwing away the data. With that being said, it's probably uh, time to, uh, to move on and to give you uh, uh, to, the, to the next speaker, but not before one final closing message that I would like to present. Um, I know that a lot of talk and media coverage has there been of the GDPR, but you can also look at it in another way. Um, you can see it as just the rules to the game. Yes, there are rules to the game. Yes, there are lines that you cannot cross and you are watched by the complete outside world is watching what you're doing. And you have other people on, on the playing field as well, as well as referees and umpires. Um, but by following the rules and within the lines, we truly believe that you're only limited by your own creativity to win, also in all the things concerning privacy. With that being said, I thank you very much. and I'm gladly handing you back to our moderator, Stephen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jan Jan Lowes, for your insights and, let's say, defining already the concept of GDPR and why people can perhaps be a little bit afraid of data privacy. Now, um, before that, we go um, on to our second speaker, which is um, Simon Hania and he is Vice President Privacy and Security at TomTom. Tom. Um, we have something that we would like to share with you, and we have a little exercise for the participants. So, uh, together with our experts, we have set up a little poll question that you now see on your screen. And uh, the idea is that you can now uh, answer the question, what is the role of your telematics service provider with regard to GDPR. Do you think that that role is that your telematics provider is a data controller, is a data processor, or you don't know? You can just indicate what you think is the answer for your telematics service provider. And then in a few moments, we will share the result on screen. So, this means that most of you are convinced that your telematics service provider is a data processor and not a data controller. Now, I don't have the correct answer, but our next speaker has. And as mentioned to you before, that speaker is Simon Hania, Vice President Privacy and Security at TomTom, and he will give a more detailed look at the different roles and responsibilities with regard to GDPR in a corporate environment. Simon. Thank you, Stephen. Um, the floor is yours. Thank you, Stephen. Very uh, delighted to be able to speak to all of you. And as, as it shows on the screen, I really want to talk to you about GDPR being the toolbox for trust. And the GDPR 
is the law that came into effect quite recently, but it's not a law that is entirely new. It builds upon more than 20 years of privacy laws, and uh, but it does take a few new angles. Uh, listed them to the right and to the left, you see a lot of other acronyms, which are actually the 28 or 27 other languages in which GDPR has been translated. So if you see these acronyms in your country, that's what it is. It is about this new privacy law. And what it actually does, it asks from companies to put individuals front and center, their rights, what they think about it, and th to think about them. And then to demonstrate ownership, to demonstrate ownership of what you do with their data, and then be able to explain that in an open and transparent way. If anything about GDPR, those are the three key objectives the lawmakers, the policymakers have had. So let, let's dive in. Um, if we look at uh, GDPR, it is about personal data. And personal data is about any data that you relate or could relate to an individual. Now, contrary to personal data, you could also think about object data. A car can be an object, but the moment a car is being driven by someone, you can pinpoint or identify the data associated with that vehicle from that vehicle, all of a sudden can be seen as personal data. And that's new to the law. It also requires you to consider data that is associated with numeric identifiers such as a vehicle identification number an ip address or a license plate to be personal data if an individual a driver is associated uh, with it which means that you can still have non-personal data anonymous data but then you need to be very very sure that not only you but actually no one can associate that driver with an individual or derive an individual from that data so that's a key thing, which means that in our view, GDPR will largely apply to everything in the space of connected cars, fleet management, leasing cars, and so on. So moving on to the next sheet, another definition GDPR takes is the roles and responsibilities. So we, we just briefly ask you the question, what do you think? Well, these are actually the legal definitions. So the data controller is in charge. He determines what's going to be done with the data. He defines the, uh, the, the objectives, the business purposes, if you wish, uh, and from that derives the purposes for which the data is being used, the various purposes. He take, takes the decisions. Now, a data controller typically is indeed the uh, company or organization that decides to implement telematics. Uh, and, and maybe that's done through a mobility manager or a fleet manager who impersonates almost that company and the decision it takes. Now, many companies don't run the systems themselves. They have that outsourced to a telematic service operator, such as TomTom Tom Telematics. And in many cases, that uh, entity uh, is to be seen as the data processor who works on behalf of the data controller. It's the extended arm of the data controller with the knowledge of data processing, but it can only do so under instruction from that data controller. Now, this is a definition in law, and you can assign it by contract, but actually it largely is determined by behavior. So if you take decisions, you become the data controller, and if you execute on those decisions, then you behave as the data processor. Now, it is the data controller who has most of the obligations under GDPR and needs to put stuff in place. And on the next sheet, I've listed 10 of the key elements that uh, a, uh, a data controller, so the, the, the fleet owner, the fleet operates and needs to be put in place. And it's not just about fleet, it's about everything, but we're focusing on fleet here. And the key one uh, is, is actually uh, enshrined in law, what Jan Jan already said, you can't do this as an afterthought. You need to do this right from the get-go by design and by default means you should not process data unless you have demonstrated it's needed. Uh, and the next key thing you need to make sure you have as a controller is that you know what data are you processing and why are you processing it. The why are the, the, the distinct purposes for which you want to use the data from the vehicle, from the driver, from other sources. You also need to know who is going to have access. Uh, who is going to be allowed to use the data. And supervisors may have less rights than uh, uh, the fleet uh, manager, 
uh, but uh, the driver needs to be uh, uh, in the loop as well. You also need to define when you're going to stop processing, when the data no longer is needed and when it's going to be destroyed or anonymized, and you need to know where it is. These are the things you also need to be able to explain. If you can't explain it, you probably shouldn't be doing it in the first place. And first and foremost, you need to be able to explain it to the individuals, the drivers. That's, that's key. And then drivers also have a couple of rights. They have a right to view the data and in some cases even have a right to download the data. Then you need to make sure everything is top-notch in terms of security, top-notch defined by the risks the, the stuff poses to the individual, and you need to be able to detect that. What's also important, and this is a, a bit stricter with GDPR, you need to have contracts with these suppliers, the data processing entities. Uh, in, in some countries, that wasn't a requirement in law. It now has become. In some countries, it was. And to those, uh, it's probably nothing really new. What's also uh, key is, is that you need to understand when you're going to do uh, a profiling of individuals and maybe even arrive at conclusions about those individuals, typically when you do driving behavior. And in order to help you do that, under certain circumstances, you need to appoint someone who oversees that internally with you, but also advises on the application of the law, the data protection officer. So I am the data protection officer at TomTom Tom because we are in scope of the obligations, but you could also decide on a voluntary basis to appoint one, your, your champion, or you could have what I would call a data protection coordinator, which is meant to not be the formal DPO, but helps you internally. Okay, these are the things you need to be uh, having in place. But once you have determined what data you're looking for and why you're using it, you also need to have the actual right under GDPR, so to speak, to produce it. And that I've listed on the next slide. And the reason to list that, can we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. Uh, is that um, there is uh, one back, please. Uh, there is a bit of a misconception that um, everything needs to be based on consent. Well, that's not true, especially in the area of uh, employ, uh, employment. In many cases, consent is not the proper way to achieve uh, all of this because consent needs to be freely given, which is difficult in the employment context. And that's why I've listed the uh, lawful basis, as they're called in the GDPR, in a different order, because in many cases you will have as a company an overriding legitimate interest. You want to achieve something for which you need data from the individuals, but what you want to achieve is so important that it trumps the individual's right to not have that data used. Let me give you an example. If you run a, a dispatch service for field service engineers, you will want to know where the vehicles are in real time in order to plan uh, in the most effective way your field service engineers. In that case, you are allowed to basically observe where they are and you can send the messages to go somewhere. And that's because you have a legitimate interest. Now, obviously, if these field service engineers are also allowed to use the data, uh, the vehicle uh, of ours, then that's not necessary. And then you should make sure that you don't put them under this observation. Now, you could do that based on legitimate interest. In some cases, it can also be done based on contract because you have a contract with the individual, which could typically be the case in a rental case uh, scenario. And George will go into a few of those later on in this uh, webinar. So consent is also an option, but sometimes uh, in many cases, it's not the best option because it has to be freely given, which in many cases really can't be done. There could also be a legal obligation. The typical example is with related to tax authorities or related to, to tachograph uh, information. The other two, I won't go into too much. So you have to choose one and you have to be able to, uh, uh, to explain that. So in order to get that right, your telematic service provider also need to produce a, a, a lot of uh, elements to that. And uh, on the next slide, I've listed a key few principles you should look at when you select your telematic service providers, who in many cases indeed will operate as a, a data processor, but he could also operate as a controller. And in that case, you have less to say, but more to verify. Um, one of the things we have said as Tonton Telematics is we want to operate as a data pro uh, processor to allow our customers to be in a way in the driver's seat. So you decide and we offer a lot of 
uh, configurability, and that's principle three. We make sure that there's a lot of options so you can configure it to your use case, your purposes, and make sure that uh, that's actually adhered to. We also offer uh, a lot of uh, explanations that you can uh, you can use to help with the explanations you have to give to your drivers or the uh, workers' representations, and of course you should rely on the telematic service providers to keep everything secure and safe because as a fleet manager that's why you ac actually uh, hire the telematic service provider uh, for now when you do so when you go to hire a telematic service providers you may have a lot of questions and in order to help you a bit we've listed 10 questions and on the next slide which you should be able to ask to your telematic service providers and here you go again do you act as a data processor or a data controller and the reason to ask that is it gives you insight in how this telematic service provider intends to operate does the telematic service provider want to so to speak own the data and define its own use cases or will it allow you to completely define your own use cases and will it adhere to what you have defined that's a key question to ask now if your telematic service provider doesn't know what it means then you're probably looking at the telematic service provider that's not well versed in gdpr and uh, to be blunt you need to think twice to engage with uh, such a service provider and of course, once you have looked into that, you need to understand what data about and from your vehicles and drivers this telematic services provider would want to store, uh, how long and how configurable is how long it is stored, and um, does it actually allow the data to be destroyed? You cannot keep, for instance, location traces for seven years. It's very hard to defend, if at all. So if that isn't configurable, you need to maybe ask or push for that. A key element also is that what is the options the drivers have to select, for instance, a business trip or a private trip? And is that material that you can use uh, to explain to your drivers readily available from this uh, company? So that's a few of the, uh, the elements the controller should look uh, into. So, this wraps up my very brief introduction of GDPR in telematics space, and I'll hand over back to Stephen. Simon, uh, thank you very much. Interesting insights and a clear explanation of the roles and responsibilities regarding data privacy. Um, ladies and gentlemen, don't forget to send your questions for, for our panel of experts via the chat function on your webinar too, because at the end we will have a lively Q&A together with our three experts. And now it's time again for a second poll question. Before that we move on to our final speaker of this webinar, and that is Josh de Boer of TomTom Telematics, who will later detail some concrete examples of GDPR implementation. I'm sure that you are interested in those clear examples. Here, of course, you already see the question on your screen. And the question is, may I, so may you collect odometer and fuel level values after each private trip? So, ladies and gentlemen, if you can give your answer so that we can share the results in a few seconds, that would be really nice. So, there is, let's say, a little bit more uh, diversity in the answers. And so we see that most of you say yes and no, so it depends. That is the answer that is mostly given, followed by yes, 35% and 21% says no. Um, I'm also sure that here, uh, during the examples that our next speaker will give, that it becomes clear who is right and who is wrong. And so let's go on to our final speaker in this exciting webinar, and that is Mr. Georges de Boer. And Georges is leader of Connected Car Initiatives at TomTom Telematics. Georges, can you hear me? I'm connected, uh, Stephen. Yes. Perfect. Perfect, thank you very much. And so we are all, let's say, interested in the examples that you are going to present and share with us today. 
Yes. Well, thanks. Thanks for the floor. And well, let's begin with the with the question uh, that we just had uh, about the odometer and uh, and fuel level. Uh, it's a bit of a trick question because it indeed it depends. Uh, it depends on uh, what you defined as the goals. So if you as a company are giving a company car for private use, but you also agree with the driver that you pay for the fuel bill. Um, and you have a KPI on uh, driving down fuel uh, uh, fuel consumption, uh, then you have a right to see also what the driving behavior has been for that driver uh, during his private trips, uh, because you that that's where you need to determine the, uh, for example, the fuel consumption. So that that is giving you the option to say yes, I'm allowed to um, uh, collect all those values. It's no if. Um, you have not went into those uh, agreements, or if you're driving a, a, a private lease car and you're paying for that uh, that that uh, part yourself, so then then you don't need that information. So it all depends. Um, and we've listed six uh, examples uh, from various uh, different uh, uh, points of view. So from a company point of view, where you are a mobility manager, uh, for example, with a delivery fleet in operational uh, fleet management or a sales fleet, um, uh, as well as with the trucks, uh, heavy goods vehicles, uh, but also the, from the leasing and the rental point of view, where you are managing a larger fleet of vehicles uh, and you're really interested in, uh, in getting the connected car data to optimize your uh, operations or digitize your operations, uh, but also to offer new services like, for example, mobility as a service. So let's quickly go through these examples. And if there are more questions, of course, you can ask them later on in the uh, Q&A. Let's go to the first example of a delivery um, uh, of a fleet that uh, is, uh, in this case, a company owner that has 100 uh, light commercial vehicles. Um, and he want, what he wants to do with his fleet is really to optimize the planning um, uh, that he has for the delivery times. Uh, what he, what he, that, so that's really his business goal. He wants to optimize the dynamic planning, but also then starts comparing the actual delivery times with what he has planned to see if there is room for improvement. Uh, the need for that, for him, of course, is to get the real-time positioning information. So he wants to track and trace on the map where the vehicles are because he wants to do dynamic planning and he wants to have historic trip information so he can do those uh, comparisons. From a GDPR perspective, uh, this is legitimate interest. So he has a business goal. He wants to uh, d collect that information about real-time positioning, for example, um, which is linked to that goal. But of course, he needs to communicate that clearly with the employees um, and to the employer's uh, representation or the employee's uh, representation. What is not needed uh, from uh, also from a GDPR perspective for this goal is to collect driving behavior because that is not defined and that is probably then also not communicated. So it's OK under this goal to collect that um, real time positioning and historic trip information, but not if that possibility is there, the driving behavior. Otherwise, he needs to define his goals differently, needs to talk with the DPO, needs to communicate differently to the employees and also uh, with the employee's uh, representation. Next example is one um, where it's about the sales fleet. And this is about the driving behavior example. So this is a mobility or HR manager that is looking after also the sales fleet of, uh, of his company. He has a, a, a fleet of consultants driving around all day. And what he wants to do is he wants to lower that fuel cost as a, from a cost saving perspective. But he also wants to get lower emissions from that fleet because after his buildings, the fleet is the second largest um, pollution of his company. And that allows him to get the ISO 14001 certification. Um, besides that, there is another next to the cost and the ISO certification. There is also a, another goal he wants to achieve, and that is to maybe improve the efficiency of the salesman. So this is uh, not necessarily the HR manager that wants to improve that uh, sales efficiency, but that's more maybe the sales manager of that company. For that, he would need historic trips for the routes. He want, needs to have the start and the end point um, during the work time, and he wants to have the driving behavior and fuel efficiency. Now, looking from a GDPR perspective, again, the goal is aligned with the need for information, so legitimate interest. Um, you, of course, need to communicate that with the driver, make sure it's part of the new employer contract and lease terms. What is not needed is the private trips. So he does not need to have insights in what the private trips are. Um, so the solution needs to be able to be turned off outside of the working time. Next example, um, 
where we talk about a lease fleet. So this is where the leasing company wants to digitize operations. It's a, a leasing uh, company with a fleet of 12,000 cars. And the goal is to optimize the fleet uh, operations and the maintenance, but also to defleet the vehicles at the right moment in time to get the highest remarketing value. So they want to change the fact that after just one certain time or mileage, but they also want to see if there's a demand on the, on the, on the remarketing market. And based on that, take a decision to defleet the vehicles. For that, of course, they need to have access to the real-time uh, vehicle data, health data, as well as to location data in, ca in case a car breaks down, as well as real-time mileage data. What does the GDPR say? Well, not a surprise, but again, legitimate interest. So there's a legitimate interest to do this. Um, um, of course, that needs to be part of the contract terms. It needs to be communicated to the drivers for the leasing about the cars, but also the, uh, the employer, so the customer, you could say, from the leasing company, um, if they are interested in, in the driving behavior. So uh, the company can decide that they want to have a view on the, on the driving behavior. That is something they separately, so in the previous example with the sales fleet, need to communicate with the drivers in their own organization. For the leasing company, there's no reason to access the driving behavior. So they need to focus on what they defined as a goal and what they agreed with the company. There's an exception. If the car is stolen, there's also a legitimate interest for the leasing company to get a real-time view on the location. Not a constant track and trace of the vehicles, but only when there is a sign of, of a stolen vehicle or a suspicion of a stolen vehicle, uh, where, this, where not only the, the location can be shown to the leasing company, but then also be sent to the recovery service for, or to the police. The fourth example is about um, an HTV fleet. So uh, this is an operations manager. He has a fleet of 50 trucks um, and he has two goals. He wants to be compliant with the resting times as uh, they are uh, defined in the legislation. And he wants to connect to a freight exchange platform to get extra orders and to minimize the trucks that are driving around empty without any load. The need for this is that he, of course, he needs to collect trip information and resting time information through the tachograph data. And he needs to, he wants to share the real time location of the vehicle when driving empty. Here we have a bit of a different um, point of view from a GDPR perspective, because for the tachograph data, there is a legal obligation. The law says that this information needs to be available. So it's very easy. GDPR allows to collect that information and also to store it for a longer time because the law says so. For the other part, the share real-time location information that is a legitimate interest from a business operations perspective uh, it will give him a, a better revenue and probably higher margins if he is allowed to do better with the freight exchange platform so that is where he can share the information with a third party um, the again this is also where you have a difference between storing the data. So the storage of the tachograph data uh, can be longer than, for example, the driving behavior data. By default, we are taking the 90 days of storing the, uh, the driving behavior data and then afterwards only the reporting on a higher level. The tachograph data needs to be stored later because um, tax authorities uh, can, can, access, uh, can have a need to access that information. So you need to make sure as a company you have that information stored longer as well. The fifth example is about um, a rental fleet and optimizing operations. Um, 20,000 vehicles, they want to optimize the car rental operations. Um, they, what they would need for that is access to the real-time vehicle health, location data when the car is lost, and they want to have fuel level data because that allows them to quickly uh, make sure you get to the next car. This is where it's different because this is where the GDPR says you have a one-to-one -one relationship. So this is based on the contract. You have a direct relationship with the end user. However, make sure that you communicate this separately from the terms and conditions. So this is not where you can say your vehicle is connected and I've put that in clause 17.0 in the, in the terms and conditions of the, of the rental agreement. This is something you need to communicate separately. This is where the GDPR is very explicitly about not hiding that kind of information in the terms and conditions. The last example is um, the sixth one on private lease, um, where we talk about mobility as a service. So this is a leasing company. They, they have a private lease offer and they want to develop new services, like, for example, usage-based insurance. Um, they want to, so depending on how you drive, you get an incentive and a discount on, the, on your premium. Automatic on-street parking payments, so based on if your vehicle is stationary with the engine turned off, uh, 
parking will commence automatically, uh, but also connected roadside assistance. So as soon as there is information coming in from a, a malfunction uh, indicator light from your vehicle, then a, a roadside assistance can be dispatched to the right location very fast and give you information about the ETA as well as mobility as a service. So you all can also have a mobility budget and based on your points that you earn, you can also spend then that money to, for a different car, for example, taking that uh, during the holidays. Um, for that, you need driving behavior, location data, as well as trip statistics and breakdown information and meals from the car. GDPR says, first of all, this is a direct relation slip, so you can put this into a contract uh, from a GDPR perspective, but there's also legitimate interest in and that is for the aggregated data on, for example, the trip statistics, where you go into uh, mobility as a service. So depending on what kind of data is uh, collected and for what, you have two uh, different parts where you can, um, uh, under, under GDPR, how you should, uh, you should file that and, and make sure you have everything covered. To wrap it up, um, I think uh, Jan Joost Jan Jan uh, clearly said um, uh, in the beginning that there is a reason for us all to uh, the why of why we should take care of uh, the the data of uh, of people if we are make, making sure that the drivers are on board it also makes it easier uh, for us uh, to um, to engage in the future and to develop new services. Um, data in the, under GDPR is now always considered as personal data, at least in our opinion as, as TomTom. Um, you need to understand your role clearly as a data controller and, and who is the data processor for you. Uh, so the data controller really makes those decisions, defines those goals, and it's good to do that already from the start. So consider that privacy from the start, privacy by design, and include your DPO as soon as possible, because if you can already explain the goals to the DPO, it becomes easier that in the end why you collect certain types of data. Um, communicate to your stakeholders and the drivers transparently, because um, let's make sure that drivers like and trust a connected car so we can all use and benefit that data uh, in the future for either op optimizing our operations or creating new services. Back to you, uh, Stephen. Thank you very much, Georges de Boer. Thank you for presenting six case studies in which GDPR has an impact. And ladies and gentlemen, as announced already, uh, we are moving on to the Q&A session. So if you have a question for our experts, Jan-Jan Lowe's of Deloitte, Simon Hania of TomTom, or, or George de Boer of TomTom Telematics, please use the chat function of your webinar tool. Uh, gentlemen, experts, thank you very much for your insights. But um, yes, uh, we have not come to an end yet because we have some questions that were sent. And here we go. Um, perhaps Simon Hania, this is a question for you. A question from a corporate fleet manager of quite a large company. And uh, I'm going to read the question that uh, the fleet manager sent us. He says, well, imagine I have a fleet with partly high damage ratio. And by using telematics, I want to identify the core for all of those damages. Is this seen as legitimate interest. Yeah, thanks. Uh, very, very, very tough question, actually. Uh, but I think uh, you need to distinguish between two steps. The first one is that you want to uh, determine what actually is the level of high interest and how that relates to the behavior of your entire fleet. So that's a processing in which you actually arrive at an aggregated result. And then the next step could be that you start to apply it to the individuals. So um, I think the first step could be based on legitimate interest, because in a way it's a st statistical purpose. And then the next step will depend on how you have communicated this to, you, to the, the drivers and what you've arranged either in contracts or, uh, uh, or in other ways. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. A question perhaps for Josh. Uh, it's related to your core business and the question is straightforward. Won't GDPR make the use 
of telematics in corporate fleets even more difficult because unions will probably invoke GDPR to refuse the use of drive data? No, I, I don't think it makes it um, uh, more complex. Uh, we've already been, like Simon uh, gave uh, in his intro, we've been working uh, on this for 20 years already with the different legislations uh, throughout the European Union and, uh, and across the globe. Um, and the only thing we now have is a bit of transparency of what is possible and what is not, but then um, on, on, on in, in, one, in one regulation. So for us, it doesn't really change a lot. Uh, it, it makes things clearer, I think, for more people uh, on what they need to think about. And I think this is all, that's also the goal, what we wanted to do in this uh, webinar, to explain that if you define those clear goals, there's no um, really... Uh, um, uh, constraint for you as a company to go for connected cars. Uh, the only thing you need to keep in mind is that you should not uh, collect data which is not uh, fit for purpose. So if you don't, uh, if you have not defined those goals, uh, you should not collect the data. Okay. Um, a question, perhaps also for Simon. Now, if any of the other experts want to comment on this, uh, you can go ahead. Um, in case I have a company fleet. And I would like to show the operations to an audience that is external to my company. Do I need, uh, am I allowed to do that? Or do I need an approval from each and uh, every individual driver? So um, here, here's actually, uh, uh, let's say, an, a judgment from a data protection authority in a case where a food distribution company, actually grocery store, wanted to show the the, the delivery van uh, on the road while driving to the uh, to the houses, and that's where the data protection authority actually said there is no real good reason to show uh, where the vehicle is other than telling its uh, estimated arrival time. So what it boils back to is to really, is there a necessity to do this or not? So uh, the, the point also is that the approval will not be valid because there is a power imbalance. What happens if a driver would, would say no? So you would have to base this on a legitimate interest, which requires a necessity test. Is this really necessary to do? And if so, uh, how, what measures have you taken to protect the individual? So I can imagine a situation in, in which you want to show a map with unidentified or unidentifiable vehicles, dots represented on a map that you show that, but then not show that close to certain uh, locations such, such as houses. So where are the vehicles currently on highways? I think that's different from actually showing this vehicle is approaching this house for the delivery of a set of uh, food. So it boils down to why do you really want to do this? Do you need to do this? And how do you protect the individual from an over intrusion into uh, effectively his behavior? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Perhaps a question for Jan Jan. Um, Jan Jan, GDPR is, let's say, a new regulation uh, that came uh, into the European Union. Now we are here in an international vehicle fleet and mobility setup. And so these people are also working with vehicles and with people, employees across the globe. Um, are there initiatives like GDPR, good initiatives like GDPR, also in other continents, or is GDPR really, let's say, the newest, the latest and the best thing that we have seen across the globe so far? Thank you for that question, Stephen. Yes, a very interesting one. And it's most certainly the case that whilst GDPR is only valid in the European Union, um, most of the countries these days across the world have some kind of privacy protection for individuals, because that's basically what we're talking about. Now, um, is GDPR the latest and the greatest? Ooh, in general, it is seen as one of the most strict ones, although one could argue that specific ones, such as in, for instance, South Korea, to, to name one, um, is more strict or at, at least at equal level. Now, not, not everybody will be operating in, in both the EU and, and, and only South Korea, but if you look throughout the world, 
um, various countries have various levels of data protection. I want to single out one specific case here because I know there's a lot of talk about. Um, the United States as a whole does not have something comparable to, on federal level, to what we call the GDPR in Europe. However, uh, due to also some recent, um, shall I say, developments around Facebook and a company called Cambridge Analytica, we see that now various states, amongst which the largest probably being California, are trying to uh, actually enact some privacy legislation that is very much resembling the GDPR. So, long story short, Stephen, to answer your question, GDPR is for Europe. There is privacy legislation all over the world. We, for now, may be the most strict one, but it's not necessarily the case that that will be for long. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much, Jan Jan. Um, a question uh, for uh, Simon and George, perhaps. Uh, imagine you are a driver. How can you assure that your personal data was destroyed and that it will not be used for something else. We can all imagine the situation that, um, let's say, you are working in a company and that at one moment perhaps you are fired or that you are leaving this company. Uh, how, do, how can you make sure that your data, your personal data, will effectively have been, let's say, erased? Uh, we can imagine that in a few years' time we will use shared self-driving shuttles, how we can imagine that that data will be erased. Is there something that you can recommend, let's say, to and the fleet managers in the companies and the employees? So let me give this uh, a first go based on what GDPR says. So if the data no longer serves a purpose, it should be erased. That's one, which means that typically if the employee leaves, there is in many cases not uh, a purpose for the data other than maybe a legal obligation or, or, or other specifics. But uh, uh, how can you as a driver uh, be sure of that? Well, as a driver, drivers have rights. You have the right to ask uh, the company, what data do you have? How long will you keep it? Uh, and what actually is it? Show me the data. And the company is obliged to deliver that information. It is called subject access request. It's not new, but it has more teeth with GDPR. And the teeth, one of them is that if as a company, you do not in a satisfactory way answer that to the driver, the driver can go to the data protection authority who also have the obligation to act upon uh, 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 complaints that have been lodged, which is also new to them, which they are doing and will do. So um, if, uh, there is a lot of, let's say, uh, uh, remedies and redress mechanisms into the law, uh, which should help the individuals. This is one of the reasons why GDPR so much focuses on putting the individual front and center. And as a company, you have to do it. And if you don't, yeah, then there is enforcement capabilities. So don't let it happen. Know what you do, know when you have to stop and how to deal with that. Mm -hmm. George, yeah, to, to, to you to make maybe a few examples. Yeah. <clears throat> Indeed. So let's take the example of the sales fleet again and the optimization. So there is uh, the company that wants to uh, optimize the uh, sales efficiency. There's no reason anymore to keep all the trip data if that empl employer uh, employee leaves the company. So that data then has to be destroyed. Uh, that needs to be destroyed anyway because uh, after 90 days you could you could say well the reporting so the more aggregated data is uh, is uh, is already fit for purpose but the the maybe the data that is also collected by the leasing company uh, which has the history of the maintenance of the vehicle so when it came into uh, maintenance how it has been driven as part of a, uh, a contract with the company to make sure it has the highest remarketing value that data um, uh, is is uh, the leasing company has a legitimate interest to keep the data. So not not all data necessarily has to be destroyed, which has been generated in the lifetime of a driver using a car. It depends on what data that is, to which level, and also who has access to that data. Hmm. Okay. So, so you should, yes. So you should clearly ask your data processor uh, or your telematic service company if they are capable of 
also making sure there are uh, ways, technical ways to configure this uh, in such a way that only those people that have access to it or when, uh, when these circumstances happen that the data can be deleted or is automatically deleted after a certain period. Hmm. So this means, for example, if I understand correctly, that, for example, a leasing company uh, is allowed to uh, record vehicle health diagnostics data for residual value optimization? Or can you, as a driver, say, well, I do not want you to use my data? Well, that, so, that, let, let me ask Simon. Yeah, yeah, that go ahead, George. Go ahead. <laughs> it depends. So if, if, you, if you just have a normal uh, a, a leasing agreement uh, where you don't necessarily state, where well, you only talk about fair, a fair use policy of the vehicle and you don't have specific agreements with your employer about how to use that vehicle, then you could question that. If you have clear KPIs set on dashboarding and you give insight to the driver how he's behaving and you say to him, you should, hey, you should, uh, you should act between certain thresholds uh, because I also have that agreement with my leasing company. I have a negotiated better terms and for you, therefore, you can drive a, a bit more expensive car because we can, we can do lower rates because we agreed on on these terms so the leasing company can can remarket at a higher value then then it's a different uh, uh, understanding simon am i am yeah, and in, in general it, it goes back to uh, the principle of privacy by default so in principle uh, from the start if you haven't defined it and haven't uh, decided and arranged for it it's not allowed but gdpr does not per se disallow it conditions apply and you have to be precise on this and then it can be done so it needs some thinking in advance. And if you don't do that, you will get stuck. Okay. Um, the following situation. Um, I am working for a leasing company and my leasing company is planning to, let's say, introduce and commercialize a telematics offer from a service provider, perhaps TomTom Telematics. Who is then the data controller and the data processor? And what is the customer's role? Or can it also be that one and the same entity has double roles? So let me pick that one up. So uh, uh, you should ask your telematics service provider how they see themselves. What what Tonton Telematics have done is basically that we behave as a data processor towards our contracting entity, which is the lease company. And the lease company then would be the data controller because they decide purpose and means, which is based on the service offering they build, which could be uh, in different ways, shapes and forms towards their clients, their uh, uh, businesses they have the leasing contract with. These companies will probably be a controller uh, in their own right because they will uh, also take decisions regarding what they do. They are closer to the individual, so they want, may want to do driving behavior uh, uh, advice, whereas the leasing company that can offer that as a service, but not necessarily use that data themselves. So it depends again on purpose, and it could very well be that the same set of data is controlled by different entities. So that could be uh, independent of each other, each takes their own decisions, but it could also be under GDPR, joint decisions, and then you become a what's called joint controller, which requires you to be very clear towards the driver who will be responsible for what. So there are multiple options there, and this is where GDPR offers a lot of flexibility to get it right, as long as you jointly put the driver first, understand what, he, what you want to do, um, demonstrate that you take ownership, and ex absolutely be open and transparent about what's going to happen. Okay, um, some uh, short questions to end this uh, exciting Q&A. The first one is, can you give us an idea what is the storage duration for driving behavior data? Is there a limit? Yes, there is a limit, as long as needed. So how long do you need it? We could argue that if you present driver behavior right away on the dash, then there is no need to store it at all. But if you want to use the data also to provide a feedback loop with with a trainer or a coach, then you may require that for a longer period, depending on, on the program. You may also want to see improvements over a period of a year, and then you need to keep it for a year. So again, describe what you want and describe what you need. 
Okay, um, going a little bit further, um, we have talked about the driving behavior. When measuring driving behavior, what does it include? For example, or how specific do you need to be uh, when determining this under GDPR? So, for example, do you have to mention every single element that you are going to track into that driver behavior, for example, let's say harsh turns and so on, or is driver behavior sufficient as a nomination? So driving behavior is, is a bit high level, I would say, but the GDPR says you need to nominate the data categories, but you, what you also need to do is, especially when you are going to derive decisions which have an effect on the individual, you need to explain how you have arrived at that decision. And another key, key element is that the driver needs to be able to understand it. So if you go into too deep a technical detail, the driver will be will be bombarded with too much detail, not understand it. If you do it at a too high level, it's not good enough. So you need to test this. What will work? And this is also why uh, workers' representation can actually be a plus because they allow you to test what will work. So this is. Also, again, where GDPR offers a lot of flexibility and open norms, which you have to apply in practice. Mm -hmm. um, two more questions. The first one is related to TomTom. -tom. The final one will be for Jan Jan Louis. Uh, the first one on TomTom. -tom. Uh, how can a telematics service provider offer support and services for their end customers without having access to personal data? And how can the customer explain a potential problem if the support operators cannot have access to the data that they need to have because on the GDPR perhaps someone has said, well, I don't want you to have access to those data. Um, so I take the question as TomTom -tom support personnel towards the, the customer. So the way to uh, uh, to do that is to, if it is needed to deliver the support, um, uh, obviously that access should be granted and can be granted. So that's not, it, it's not like GDPR prohibits it. It again conditions it on a need to have a need to know basis and support can be a relevant uh, purpose for which at that point in time, the data is opened up, so to speak. Okay, thank you very much, Simon. Uh, final question for Jan Jan. Jan Jan, we have seen throughout this webinar that let's say everything that has to do with GDPR, everything that has to do with data privacy, it's quite complex. So uh, we also saw it in the number of questions that we received from the audience. Now, perhaps one of the most important questions, what if my organization is not yet 100% ready in terms of GDPR. Is that really a danger or do you have any recommendations? That's an interesting, <clears throat> interesting question, Stephen, and thanks for whoever on the webinar asked this. Um, well, it is a law and as of 25th, last 25th May, you should comply with it. In reality, we have done studies, we've done studies across multiple branches, and we see that companies that actually say themselves that they are fully compliant with GDPR, at this moment in time, is somewhere between 15, so it's 1.5, and 25%. So we all know that not everybody is completely fully ready. Now, would that be an argument for not doing anything at all? Um, I would advise against that. Uh, not doing anything at all and not striving towards compliancy um, is not a good thing, specifically not when a regulator visits you and sees that you are not compliant and you can't answer the question, well, what have you done over the last couple of years? If a regulator visits you and you are not compliant and you can show that you have made at least some progress over the last couple of years and working hard to, to actually uh, in the direction of compliance, well, theoretically, they could still fine you but they are allowed to apply some leniency. So um, that being said, what would be best, be best advice? Um, take this seriously, take this very seriously. It is a law and you can get fines, specifically if something goes horrible wrong with your data. 
But on the other hand, it should be real and it should feed into your current business operations and not disturb them just for the sake of GDPR. So if you have determined that there is a plan in place which will bring you to compliancy over the next two years, that's fine, roll with it and go that way. Um, if you will have a serious incident in the meantime, yes, I would say that's unfortunate. Doing nothing at all and thinking, well, uh, listen, uh, uh, I'll probably never get caught or this will never happen anyway, I would truly advise against that. Okay, thank you very much, Jan Jan Louwees. Thank you, Simon Hania, and thank you, Georges de Boer. Thank you for uh, the expertise. And of course, also uh, Tom Tom Telematics, thank you for supporting us with the organization of this webinar of Fleet Europe. The recorded version of the webinar will be made available online on our website fleeteurope.com so you can have again a look at what you have witnessed during the previous hour and we ask you to spare a few minutes of your time to answer the satisfaction survey. I hope that you enjoyed this Fleet Europe webinar on GDPR and data privacy with the support of TomTom Telematics and I hope to welcome you again in an upcoming webinar. Thank you very much and bye bye.